I want to say a big thanks to you if you subscribed to the channel because you saw my video about how I bought a cottage in Sweden. This one is about the process of the house buying but also some of the thought process behind it in terms of how I chose the property that we ended up buying. And I'll also be sharing some of the things I wish we'd known before we bought the house and things I think I'd probably do differently a second time around. First, I'm just going to ask some of your questions. Um, how are we getting on in winter? Well, this is winter. It's about two degrees out here. It was about minus four, according to the how it felt factor yesterday, which was a bit chilly. I'm sat here wearing <laughs> gloves and I'm sat on wet moss with a wet bottom uh, to film this for you because I thought this was a cute spot. I've been back in the UK. My son has been staying at the cottage for the last couple of months and he's getting on really well. We're running out of wood a little bit. It's a little bit challenging getting wood right in the middle of the season. Um, he's chopped down a couple of trees for wood for next season, but that's not gonna help him this season. But he is loving it. They're going for swims in the lake on a regular basis. Yes, even in December. How is my Swedish? Interbra. <laughs> it's not great. I have to say I haven't been working really hard at it but I have sensed that bit where I'm starting to get a framework to hang the new words on and sort of to try and put sentences together just and I have my first sort of like using Swedish actually in the wild as it were I was out on a walk going through this empty farmyard and then suddenly this farmer was there and it's like the farmer at end of a drive and he was like what are you doing here and I was able to say oh, I've come from this house. And then when I stopped later on to take photos of the snow because it was so beautiful, and he came up thinking I was lost or couldn't find my way, even though there was lovely red tape all the way, I was able to say, I'm from England. I really love the snow. The snow is pretty. So I was quite pleased with that. What about mobile phone and internet at the cottage? I think it must be the only place, the one spot in Sweden where there's no 4G, because there's 4G everywhere that I've been in Sweden, everywhere, really good 4G. There was a good foundation. It wasn't just some wild idea I had. It had been something that I'd been brewing under for a while. Perhaps you're not aware that I actually had the incredible privilege of living in the Falkland Islands in the South Atlantic for a couple of years in the mid 80s. That was an incredible time. We lived in Fox Bay on West Falkland where there was about probably 50 people altogether, a handful of families. And it was an amazing time. We had our own polytunnel, we cut our own peat, we grew our own vegetables, we grew our own pigs, we had our own chickens. And it was really amazing to live a self-sufficient lifestyle. We also caught our own fish, really huge fish they had out there, mullet. And it was an amazing time of being self-sufficient and being in a community. Now, not everybody gets on all the time in the community, but you're there for each other. So when um, a Land Rover or a digger gets stuck or bogged as they call it in the Falkland Islands, everybody pitches in, stops what they're doing and helps get it out because that's just the kind of community it is. So that was an amazing place to be and I think somewhere in my life I've always wanted to, I've always kind of hankered to go back there and um, actually you know what I've been looking around my house and it's really interesting that I've got books about living in remote places in Scotland in a tiny little place in the Hebrides and Actually, I've already got three pictures of really cute cottages, very similar to mine, even including the Falkland Island cottage, which I'll try and put a picture on the screen here of, around my house. So it was obviously something that just gave me a sense of peace, just this idea of a cottage lifestyle. So perhaps your dream is to just find somewhere cosy and snug that you can uh, find to rest, or maybe it's to get away from the rat race, or maybe it's time for you to downsize and find something small and just stop working so hard. So here's a question. Should you buy a house in Sweden? Well, I'll be honest, I can't answer that for you, but I can tell you about my experience and how easy it is to buy a house in Sweden if you have the money. For us, that was about £20,000, which I think is around 250,000 Swedish crowns, roughly. The website I found the cottage on is called hemnet, H-E-M-N-E-T dot S-E. They have a website, but they also have a really good app. And what's great about it is either via the app or the website is that you can set up notifications so you can set particular criteria. So the criteria on there are really quite interesting. So you can have the size of the house, the size of the land. You can have how close it is to water. You can have how old the house is because a lot of Swedes don't want an older house, they want a newer house and you can have a number of rooms. So you can set up your criteria as well as sort of maximum and minimum prices and stuff. 
And so that's been really helpful. So I have to say secret delight in the mornings is just like my notification email from hemnot.se, which I still have set up, even though I have a place here. The app is brilliant. If you've got a phone, you can put it on or just the website and they've got really good pictures and actually loads of pictures, lots of properties. have got sort of 10, 20, 30 pictures of both the inside and the land. And that's been really helpful. That gives you some idea, not all the idea, because they don't take pictures of everything. Clue number one. <laughs> There's a setting on Google Chrome whereby you can just automatically translate the Swedish into English, navigate the site all in English. A lot of the estate agents that I've spoken to do speak really good English. If they don't, then you can send them a message either in English, but I would recommend going onto Google Translate, translating your English to Swedish and then translating their Swedish reply back into English using Google Translate. That's worked for me fine. And it just seems a bit more polite uh, where it's not clear whether the estate agent does or doesn't speak English to actually send messages in Swedish. I had some quite clear criteria. I didn't have much money, but I wanted to have at least a half an acre of land. I didn't want it to be too far from the airport. I wanted to be able to come out for sort of like longer weekends, invite friends out for longer weekends. I wanted it to be within walking distance of a lake. I didn't want to have to get in the car for a lake because I used to have to get in the car to walk my dog and that was just really irritating. So I wanted to be able to walk to a lake, not necessarily walk to a swimming lake, but I wanted to be able to walk to a lake just to go and sort of breathe out and just breathe in that calm from being around the lake. And obviously I had my upper price limit. So I guess my question to you is, what are your criteria? How many bedrooms do you need? What size space do you need? I didn't say, but actually one of the things I love about the cottage that we've got is it's got this big square room where you've got the settee and the dining table. It feels like this big space, unlike a lot of English spaces where you've got long thin rooms and small tiny rooms and you have to see how much you can squeeze in. This room was a big room and that you can reorganize it because one of the things I've always done in my houses is like get a bit bored with the layout, reorganize it. So another question to ask yourself is what do you need and what can you do without? Do you need electricity? Do you need running water? Are you happy with well water? Are you happy with getting your water from a stream or a lake? Do you need really good internet? When you're talking to the estate agent, these are questions you can ask because often the listings aren't always clear about whether they've got water or electricity. Um, sometimes they'll say that there's water to the border or electricity to the border, but then obviously you've got to pay the connection or even internet to the border of the property and you need to pay the connection fee. But these are all questions to ask. And if you're in a snow zone as well, a question to ask is whether that is one of the roads that gets cleared from snow in the winter, because obviously that's going to make a big difference to you. So my cottage has got water from a pump and it does have electricity. So it's not off grid. It feels kind of off grid because it's rural and so on. I think there's enough sort of challenges with it, like the challenge with finding firewood and the challenge of having to draw water every day and then boil water and washing up is not straightforward. So it has enough challenges to sort of keep me on my toes, but like not no electricity so that you can charge all the electric devices and that you know you can charge your phone and your computer and you can sit and work on a computer during the day those are all useful things to be able to do one of the things on hemnet.se is often they'll have i don't know the pronunciation but it's under drift costnad and then slash ar which is or so it's the costs the running costs per year and obviously up north that's going to include massive heating costs so if you're looking at anything up north you're going to be looking at two three thousand pounds a year or two and a half four and a half thousand dollars per year for running costs whereas the uh, cottage we bought probably said about 800 pounds which is probably about a thousand dollars a year and it's worth asking what that includes i've just seen naomi jack's new video i want to sign off and watch it but i'm gonna finish this one for you guys <laughs> For ours, that includes costs towards the road, the electric, the standing order for the electric. The electricity itself is reasonably priced, but the standing order for the electric is actually more for my Swedish cottage than it is for my British apartment with all my electric in. So it's just weird things like that. But that said, it's probably about £30 a month, which isn't steep. And then there's a cost towards the road contribution, what wasn't in those £800 costs because the people who owned it had a place in Gothenburg or Jutteborja, I'm going to say that wrong again. So they were able to take their rubbish um, away with them so they didn't have to pay for rubbish disposal. 
So that was one cost that we have that they didn't have because they already had somewhere they could dispose of their rubbish and there isn't communal places you can dispose of rubbish so you do need to pay for that. I will get on to the whole viewing and buying process in a minute, just stay tuned because I think there's some helpful things in here before I get there. Here's a few things we didn't realise <laughs> that I think we wish we had. First of all is that the photos are edited to within an inch of their life so although most Swedish homes have a lot of light in they definitely put some kind of filter on there so it looked like even more light and the floor colouring in the photos was a really light it looked like it had just been polished and when I got in there it's like it was almost like there was a real sense of shock as I walked into the space because it didn't look like the same space at all in that initial moment I still loved it but it didn't look like the same place because the floor was a really dark colour but the photos have portrayed it in a different colour. Also something to be aware of is there will be things that they don't take photos. So in fact on our half acre there are two sheds which are so ubiquitous and so boring that they hadn't even bothered to photograph them so we had two sheds good size that just hadn't been <laughs> included in the listing which is just like to me it's bizarre. I wish I'd taken photos when I've gone back and reviewed other places I've taken video because actually that's really helpful. When your brain gets a bit fuzzy and you're like what did that look like again you can just review the video because I say the estate agents uh, photos don't take pictures of everything. I've looked at two different properties where the chimney is fixed and it's not as crumbling but there's bricks out of sink or whatever and one where the chimney would look like it was in danger of falling down. There were no photos of that so if you're buying I really 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 recommend you coming to see a property otherwise you might end up with a like a friend of mine who bought a place here and has ended up with a problem to fix which was unexpected simply because there were things that weren't shown on the photos. <laughs> so definitely have a visit and when you do have a visit look at everything go in every space go up in the loft take a torch with you go down in the cellar or the basement if there is one have a look in every space so you can see whether there's damp anywhere whether there's something a crack or anything that might mean that the price you see is too much too little or is a really good price it's something to bear in mind depending on what your property buying uh, traditions are in your country often the price shown on hemnet.ac is what they're inviting as the starting price now obviously you can bid below that you have to decide what you're happy with so it's not saying you can't bid below that because that's actually what we did because i wasn't able to go to the full price but i really wanted it so we bid what we were able to afford i think it's worth knowing that you know say it says 250,000 you might get it for 200,000 you might be lucky if there's not loads of interest or there's loads of work to be done on it but also that could go up higher and you have to be prepared for that it will all depend on how many people are interested in the viewing the property let me get on to that once the property is listed on the estate agents website usually within about two weeks there is an open day or a viewing day on that day everybody gets to see it sometimes that's within a 30 minute or a one hour window what's good about this is everybody gets to see it on the same day everybody gets to bid in the same time frame within four weeks of the viewing date or possibly less you could actually hold the keys to that property in your hand hello and i think it's wonderful on instagram that you can announce really important things like i bought a house in sweden for real this is i don't know it's my house in Sweden. Hey! <laughs> Sometimes you just gotta do what you just gotta do. What I would say is if you're planning to fly out to view a property, ask a bunch of questions before you come. Are there any flaws with the property that you can see that aren't shown in the pictures? Because I've done that. I've flown out to see something and walked up and the chimney's crumbling and I can then suddenly see that the chimney's at an angle and the bricks that are supporting it are barely hanging in there and I'm like that's too much work for me and I loved 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 the rest of the house and the setting and everything about it but actually that one thing was a stopping point I would say I had a lovely tour of the area you can probably see it in my video of coming here in October there's a picture somewhere in the middle of derelict house in the middle of a field in the middle of the autumn colors which I thought was beautiful but I just didn't feel comfortable about buying it and I didn't know whether when I came back in the spring whether even the chimney would still be there and then that was just going to be too much work and too much expense for me to take on. 
So as I said, within two weeks of its listing, there's usually a date for viewing. It's best to try and attend that viewing if you possibly can. If you're in the area, but the viewing isn't till another day, is often if you call the estate agents, especially if it's a summer house and there's no one living there, is that you can actually go and look around the outside. You can walk around the grounds and that's been really helpful. You know, you can go around the land and you can look in the windows of the property. As I say, if there's a summer cottage and there's nobody there and get a feeling for whether it sort of feels right for you. Sometimes the vendor will be there often not, but that is your time to ask questions that you want to ask of the vendor and the estate agent as the intermediary then can ask any questions on your behalf about things like boundary and services and the history of the property. Any questions you have, your viewing day is the time to ask them. And as I say, it can be really weird and a little feel pressured because you're pitching up and actually all these other people are sort of, the cars are parking there and you've got three or four other couples walking around and you're just sort of looking at the same time, kind of spying each other up <laughs> is the most peculiar thing. But actually it's kind of good because it makes you sense, okay, you know, how much do I want this? And actually there is a sense that you do need to act fairly quickly. So I've mainly viewed properties on a Saturday and then I think the cottage, we probably put the bid in. I was trying to play it cool. I was like, I'm playing it cool. I think I waited till like 11 o'clock in the morning to phone and put the bid in. I was desperate to call at nine o'clock, but I waited till 11 because I didn't want to show that I was too keen. But I think we were probably the only people bidding on that cottage. I think there were probably some other people went round that day. Perhaps it was too much work for them, but it was just my dream home as it were. And everything about it really felt perfect and it felt like the right place. And so for a week or so, kind of sat there waiting, waiting to see, because not understanding the Swedish system was just like, I don't know how this is going to work. And obviously there's often a deadline for bids to be in. I didn't know whether somebody was going to come in at the last minute with a higher bid and sort of pip us to the post. But thankfully that didn't happen. And I was then called to say, your bid has been successful, which was amazing. At this point, you're not 100% committed. You are then invited. You have, I think, quite a short period. I'd like to say 48 hours, but it's not very long to put down a 10% deposit. And that is forfeitable if you don't go through with the sale. Now, if you are interested in a property, you do need to register your interest. And that will mean that then once the bids start coming in, you will get notified. Hopefully, if it's a good estate agent, you'll get called or emailed to ask you if you're interested in bidding on the property. But you do need to register your interest and let them have your email and your phone number. What's really great then is as soon as a bid is placed, so certainly I've had this on one property, sometimes it's closed bids, but mostly it seems to be open bids, I think. Uh, when it's open bids, you'll basically just get a text saying, bidder one has bid this amount. And then, you know, you might get a bid a couple of days later saying bidder three has bid this amount. And then bidder one has bid a higher amount. And so you get, you, nobody names names, but you can see which bidder is bidding. And there's no onus necessarily on the property owner to sell it to the highest bidder, but they do have the discretion and they can decide who they're comfortable selling it with. Now, the part I like about the whole system is that there are no solicitors. In the UK, the person who's selling as a solicitor and the person who's buying has a solicitor and supposedly they talk to each other but then what actually happens is you have to remind the solicitor to do their job and then they don't do their job and then everything takes weeks and it's really frustrating whereas what happens here is that the estate agent who sold it to you handles all the legal paperwork which is why you can have it that you actually can pick up the keys almost next day if everything's done and dusted I think if we'd been in Sweden, the whole process would have taken four weeks, but because the paperwork had to come back with some forwards, I think it took about six weeks altogether before we could come over and pick up the keys. So as a time scale for the UK, that's incredibly swift. On that last day, that's the day when the money is exchanged. So usually the money would be transferred from one Swedish account to another. That's all handled by your estate agent. And so it's totally secure and your money is totally safe. Now, because there's no way that I can get a Swedish bank account, I set up a transfer from my own account into the vendor's account. So there was a, a significant amount of trust there um, between us that they weren't going to run away with my money. I don't think I would have done it. If it was 10 times the price, I think I would have found another way of doing it. For £20,000, which was a lot of money, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't my life savings forever. I was comfortable doing that and I was comfortable that I trusted the people that I was buying from. If you've done it yourself, please tell us in the comments below how you would advise doing it because 
if you haven't got a Swedish bank account, that is a little bit of a sticking point. Because our cottage is a summer cottage, uh, designed really for just going to at weekends, in the summer, and maybe at Christmas, those kinds of things, what we hadn't realised until the very last minute was all the beautiful furnishings and furniture and shed contents and everything were included in the price. And that was just the most amazing thing that we were left a chainsaw, a mower, a massive corner sofa and tables and chairs and a really fabulous pine bed, chests of drawers, all the contents of the kitchen. That just blew me away that all those things were included <laughs> in the £20,000. It was just like incredible and certainly seeing other people's stories, Naomi and Jack and uh, Yona, their cottages came with all the stuff. It's just a really lovely and generous thing to do. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful tradition. So what would I do differently? I think I've covered quite a few of those. I think we hadn't really thought about how much wood we'd need if we were here in the winter. I don't think anybody can be prepared for Swedish mosquitoes in the summer. And I think because we'd been to Sweden and stayed by a lake where there's always quite a breeze which actually blows the mosquitoes away, to say, be somewhere still, and also I didn't think it helps that we had the long grass and I think there was a lot of mosquitoes hiding in the long grass. I don't think we'd really thought that through, that actually if we wanted to be outside, that there's not a space we can be outside but not be surrounded by mosquitoes. We did take a look at the weather but I've been looking at possibly buying a second property or going further up near Mora, looking to see the weather there and the fact that people have snowmobiles, so it's pretty snowshore. So it would be colder, yes, but that you'd have the beautiful snowy scenery for some of the winter and you could go out at Christmas and expect for it to be beautiful white snow. To be honest, I love where we are because it's within a couple of hours of the airport. It's within a couple of hours of my very favorite lake of all time. I wouldn't really change it, but if I did buy somewhere else, I would definitely check out whether it had 4G coverage standing in the sitting room. One of the things we didn't think to ask, although we have that beautiful wood stove, the Vedspies, we didn't ask whether they'd ever got it going. It looked really pretty and we still haven't been able to get it going. So I think I would have asked those questions so that we knew what we were getting into. Yeah, I definitely would have asked for a couple of phone numbers, the phone number of someone where I could get logs and the phone number of a chimney sweep so that we could get the chimney swept. We underestimated one particular challenge. In the UK, in most cities, there's laundrette. So actually going and getting your washing done, it's not a big problem. Whereas actually in Sweden, because every apartment block has its own laundry building, there aren't what I would call a laundrette where you can walk in and use a washing machine and a dryer. We have to pay laundry to get them done because at the moment there's no washing machine, spin dryer or tumble dryer at the cottage. That's costing quite a bit of money per week with my son staying there to get their clothes and the bedding washed and everything. It's not an insignificant challenge. Something you don't know until you discover it. <laughs> Another question to ask is, are you just going to be using it for holidays like the Swedish do in terms of a Swedish summer cottage and just going to go there for the occasional vacation? Or are you thinking that maybe that could be somewhere you live in the long term? If that is the case, there's a couple of Swedish websites, Swedish migration website, that you can find out how long you can stay in the country before needing to register as a resident. Would I buy a house in Sweden again? <laughs> Absolutely, I would in a heartbeat. It's been an amazing place to come. It's a fabulous retreat. I get to sit here in the forest in three degrees and just soak it all up. And I can just feel my heart rate slowing down even as I'm talking to you now and just, just the sense of calm and it's just so peaceful. So 100% I would do it again in a heartbeat. So if this is something you've been dreaming about for years, I honestly want to say there's no time like the present. None of us knows what the future holds, but any one of us can reach out and grab that moment and make the most of the resources we have and plan for a future with more joy and less stress. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching.